finish looking at structure, which is not something you're likely to use in any actual application, but it's a way of looking at the way the populations, or better, the individuals in those populations, are differentiated or clustered by the particular set of markers that are used. So it's very, um, it is very dependent on both the markers and the populations to determine what patterns will come out. And as I mentioned, multiple repetitions and choosing the most likely will tell you something about the nature of those individuals in those populations with those markers. Then, how to use some of those markers to try to identify an unknown. The best way is to use relative likelihoods. And we've programmed FROG, the home page, frog.med.yale.edu, and here's the home page in what I think is best called a pre-beta version. It's not final by any means, but some of the functionality is now quite robust. We can look at individual identification SNPs and ancestry informative SNPs. Let me first go into individual identification SNPs. We've programmed in two panels of SNPs, the one we developed and published a um, little over a year ago, and one developed by the SNP for ID consortium in Europe that is now being used in forensic labs approved and certified for forensic use. There's nothing on SNPs approved in the United States. This set, we have examples. We have the list of the populations that are involved in these examples a page of data entry so that you can, for each of these SNPs, put in by clicking the genotype at each SNP for the individual you are studying. But let's start by a preloaded set of data. Here is a Mexican Pima individual. And here are the genotypes that have been entered at all of these SNPs. Incidentally, this has a link into dbSNP defining the SNP molecularly and a link into Alfred where you can find the population distribution of that SNP for all of the populations for which Alfred exists. Alfred has data. These data are preloaded. At the bottom, we can compile. And it takes a minute. We're going over the internet. The calculations are being done at Yale, and here now is the output. And we have it both in a tabular format and in a graphic format. And we need to decrease the screen size to get everything on. And so this is better. We can't see on this screen the bottom of the, f of the graph, but you can see the individual populations. So the probability 
of the input genotype of this one Mexican Pima individual is about 10 to the minus 17. It's greater than 10 to the minus 18. But by an order of magnitude, which is the level of significance, all of these other at 10 to the minus 18, a Druze from the Mideast, a Takuna from South America, a Sandawe from East Africa, and here even the Hausa from West Africa is not much different. So it's in fact not significantly different. So these markers are not good for ancestry information, but the purpose of this set of markers is to make the probability of a match, i.e. of the genotype occurring again in one of these populations, essentially independent of population. Now, the graph shows it's not independent. You can mouse over this graph and see the values and the populations. But down here at the bottom, if we scroll down a bit, you can see, and you can print this if you want, other populations are down at 10 to the minus 23. So it's about five orders of magnitude, but the populations don't occur in any particular geographic order. But what one can say is that this is a rare genotype any place in the world. We can go back to those data. And as an example, we can arbitrarily make many of these SNPs unimportant where we had no data. One doesn't need data on all of the markers to get some information. So we've now basically set to no knowledge many of these SNPs by selecting no, no. And at the bottom, we can compile the new data set. And when the data come back, you will see that all of these numbers are larger. We're now in the 10 to the minus 12 range. So this is an indication of the power of these markers. 10 to the minus 12 is certainly in the range of many of the standard CODIS markers. And we don't have the Mexican Pima coming out at the top. And in fact, it's way down here, significantly less likely than a South American Indian or an East African hunter-gatherer. The curve has roughly the same shape with some populations much less likely. But still, we're in the range of only four orders of magnitude here. So it's not terribly useful. We can put in other individuals, or we can go to an example here of an Indian who, from Kerala, for the 52plex from SNP for ID, and look at how well that works. And here you see we've got roughly the same order of magnitude from 10 to the minus um, 
about 10 to the minus 18 to 10 to the minus 24. But where is the carolite? This is an individual. Well, the carolite isn't here because these markers in the databases for all these populations, these are the populations that have the most data, and the carolite aren't in there. So what is similar? Well, we've got uh, Somali, we've got Turks, and Portuguese, and Germans, and Colombians. We can't really say anything about the ancestry of this individual. What we can say is, in almost all parts of the world for which we have these data, we can use even 45 of the 52 SNPs and still show that this is a very rare genotype any place in the world. So in terms of individual identification, match probabilities, these are very good in part because they've desi been designed to give low probabilities anywhere in the world. But the opposite of that is looking at ancestry informative SNPs, where, again, we have examples that one can pull up. Here is a Hungarian, and we can look at the data that were input, and over here on the right are the data that were output, and we see that this is a Hungarian, but the Hungarian is the fifth most likely. And again, the match probabilities really are a few orders of magnitude, but even those that are very low probability are a mixture of Africans, Native Americans, and those that are high probability include Southwest Asia, Hungary, Europe, and even other European populations. Some information here, because the markers vary a bit more than in the 45 SNP panel, but it's still not um, super, and it's only 39 pilot SNPs. We can load another Hungarian individual and actually do the calculations. So this is another individual from Hungary. For these 39 pilot SNPs, and when the data come back, we can see that now, for these markers and this individual, there is a very good range. It's 10.5 times 10 to the minus 7. There are several others here that are not significantly different, but they're all European. And at the other end, we're down at 10 to the minus 43, 10 to the minus 34. And this panel is giving very strong ancestry information. And we can scroll over, mouse over this, and see the various populations and how they arrange graphically. And here, where there's this big change, we've got Southwest Asia, and then it moves on to Central Asia, and South Asia, the Pacific, 
and we get into Native Americans, Cambodians, etc. Clearly, many orders of magnitude that allow one to make an inference on ancestry. The important point here is while this is the probability of the genotype, one has to think about statistical significance. So 10 to the minus 5, uh, 10.5 to the minus 7, and 7.5. It's a ratio of not quite 2, about 1.4. Clearly, it's not much more likely to be a Hungarian than to be an Ashkenazi Jew or a, not quite twice as likely as being Irish, about twice as likely as being Danes, not significantly different. So one of the things this shows, though it's a small number of SNPs, being used, 37 out of the potential 39, it's giving clearly a region of the world. And in the literature, there are a lot of publications that argue that they can be very precise with their set of markers for exactly which population this individual came from. And I don't think that's possible. I th certainly not with any set of markers I'm aware of. And it's only that they're able to look at populations for which they have adequate samples. So we have over 2,000 samples from 45 populations in this implementation and we'll gradually get more. The other set, we can also look, let's go to the Korean. This, the Korean is preloaded for every marker for most of these 128. We can try to compile them. Aha, some have not been filled out there are some missing ones. So what we can say is we didn't fill it out because it's unknown. So we simply set all of those that hadn't had a genotype specified to NN, the unknown, and now we can compile it. So this is a kind of check that you've entered as much of the data as you really have. And Koreans come out at the top. But look for this large number of loci, 103 out of the 128 we had data on. And it's in 10 to the minus 38. So it's very rare. But notice the bottom of this, where we have Biaka pygmies and other Africans were from 10 to the minus 38 down to 10 to the minus 80. That's 40 orders of magnitude. So this is that it is someone from near the top, all of which are East Asians, to someone near the bottom from Africa. This is 10 to the 40th power more likely. It's a huge ratio. Anything above a factor of 10 is essentially significant. One can go into this data again and bring back up the data set. And one can set more of these to unknown Again, one can go down to a very small number. And rather than do it on this data set, let's go back to the 39 markers. And here, if we set some of these markers 
to unknown and just more or less randomly eliminate a lot of them. So this example is designed to show that even if you have data on only a few of the markers, so we eliminated 20 out of the 39, notice these probabilities of the genotype are much larger, but we still go from 10 to the minus 3 down to 10 to the minus 23. And again, these are Europeans and Africans at the bottom, and up near the top are a lot of the East Asians. Koreans is not at the top, but it's not significantly different. It's almost identical in probability to the best. And there are a lot of East Asians within an order of magnitude. So all of these, even including the Micronesians, and pretty much up into Siberia, the Yakut, a very flat likelihood across East Asia, one really could not say much about the ancestry here except Far East Asia. So one can play with this. There are unknown examples available being emailed and available otherwise that have, I think it's 15 individuals, for these 39 SNPs. And at some point, you can also get the population from which each individual came. And this is an online, free, publicly available data set um, and a database and web site that is free and publicly available. And it's using standard population genetics and probability calculations to be able to look at ancestry inference and matching probabilities with the II SNPs. What's important to note here is this isn't a final ancestry panel that's been fully optimized. The Selden panel has been studied on more populations than any other panel, but it's not optimized for all parts of the world. We're working on that. There will be changes. Other people are studying markers in other populations. But clearly, it is possible if you've got a reasonable background for even a few SNPs to give significant information on ancestry, at least to the regional level. So one doesn't have to have a large number of SNPs, if the SNPs are included in one of these two sets, you can enter one or two SNPs, enter five, and see how informative they are. Different SNPs will be informative in different parts of the world. So 
there are problems in getting this sort of technology accepted into the forensic community, but as an investigative tool, some police departments are already trying to get ancestry information. Included in here are some phenotype informative markers, such as mentioned in the lecture. So we're looking at these, and I would encourage you to become familiar with this technology, and this database is designed to make it easy to apply. Mm -hmm.